Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 433 that's 433 como estas mi amigos how you doing wherever you may be great amazing good to hear if it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast, please download and share with all your family and friends. And support via Patreon is always more than welcome. You get one bonus episode on Patreon for you only subscribers. And you can subscribe for as little as £1 or $1 per month on patreon.com. Agostino. That's patreon.com. A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. The first post is going to go online at the end of this week so get involved at patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o thanks for all support i'm fast approaching 8,000 subscribers on youtube that is a goal and a mission that i'll obviously achieve this week sometime but keep on sharing keep on promoting keep on putting it out there for me and um, get the reach up there for me if you can i very much appreciate the support in the comments and all that malarkey and all the thumbs up nice one and of course pock up support just download the hell out of the show, increase my numbers that way, play it in the background, you know, put the volume down if you don't want to hear my annoying voice. Just let help those numbers go up so I can go out there and collect the paper. Anyway, how are you guys doing, man? Whew. Got loads of stuff in my mouth. Yucky. Lovely yucky. How are you guys doing? Are you all right? Good. Amazing. How am I? I'm doing pretty well, all things considered. Um, could be better. Like I mentioned in the last podcast, I do feel really ugly. I think um, I feel even more uglier now that I'm doing this in the daytime and I can kind of see myself what I actually look like in the camera. And it's, ugh, it's horrendous. I look really fluffy. Um, as I mentioned in other podcasts, like I feel... I feel like I need a, I feel like I need a deep cleanse, right? I need a shave. I need a steam room. I need a manicure, um, maybe a pedicure, a little massage. I need, I, need, I need a lot of work to be done once the world reopens. But again, I'm confident in it will. I'm confident in it will. Don't listen to all the scaremongering tacticians out there who are telling us that, oh, you're not going to be able to go out again until the end of the year. Strap up. You're going to have to wear a mask for the rest of your life. Like, get, get jog on. At most, what will happen is that most people will probably carry on wearing their face masks in a tube and, you know, close um, areas where they're in, in close confined, yeah, close confined areas with strangers. People will most likely um, continue wearing those or what will end up happening, people just end up burning them in some sort of um, burning mass, burning man-esque celebration where they basically do away with the shackles of these face coverings that have basically been a symbol of their hopes and dreams being dashed for a good what two years off the back of some you know novel virus that spread from somewhere in far east asia as we've been led to believe but like i said either people wear them in planes and on and in underground services only or you know people don't wear them at all but regardless don't worry by let's say March onwards will be in a much better place, especially UK wise. In the US, you've got nothing to worry about. If you want to live a carefree life, just go in, just go down to parts of the South and you're ba basically living in a um, non-COVID world, right? Places like Atlanta, um, Florida, Miami, um, Texas and stuff, right? They're basically not caring about the virus at all. It's quite gnarly to see, isn't it? You see all the celebrations taking place with the Super Bowl. That was a real mindfuck, man. It was really, really impressive to see that there are places in the world where they've just ignored COVID. I think another one in Europe might be, if I'm not mistaken, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Hungary. Is it Hungary? Lukashenko. Is it? Was was what is the prime minister's name? Is name something Lukashenko? Is it Hungary? Uh, prime minister. Oh, let's see if I can find it. I think it was Hungary. It's a place in Hungary where basically the prime minister's like, nah, man. Um, it doesn't exist here. Um, you guys are fake news. Keep on doing what you're doing. Let me see if I can find it. It's a pretty interesting guy, actually. Um, I think he's a prime minister of Hungary. Or there might be more. I forgot where it is. Let me see if I can get it up. I followed this really pretty cool um, Russian profile. Something that I kind of always retweet. It's something X. Oh, I don't know what the name is. I wish, I wish you could get it up on here. It's quite hard to find out who you're following on Twitter. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> Got it. It's a it's a uh, profile called X Soviet News, all one word. X Soviet News. Um, it's pretty cool. I recommend you check it out. Um, let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can find it. You go on the person's profile. Um, I think it's Lukashenko or someone. 
but it's pretty he's pretty similar to like Ron DeSantis right um who's I think is he Florida or is he Miami whatever one he is right he's like that kind of guy who kind of has effectively ignored COVID and said he doesn't exist um it's not a thing to worry about and then this guy who I'm gonna get up yeah there you go I got it uh uh, 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 uh. Oh, that's his name Lukashenko what, what is it yeah he's, he's the prime minister of Belarus um he had some very interesting things to say regarding COVID let me see if I can find the actual post itself I think it was from a day ago this person posts a lot in it it's better that it's actually better the person posts a lot on Twitter than it is when you follow have you ever been because again this is only only because you know of COVID I'm actually on these platforms I've actually turned into a lot more of a gossip queen than I was prior because of COVID. I'm having to fill my time up and just I'm looking at bullshit news, following these, you know, really um, gossipy female rap beef Twitter accounts, analyzing every single minute detail of these girls' lives. And then I'm looking at all this other stuff that's going on social with influencers and stuff. I've turned into a real B-I-T-T-H. I've turned into somebody that I really don't like, I have to say. First of all, my face looks fluffy. I'm in a worship I've ever been in my life and I'm following gossip about, you know, 14-year-old influencers influences on tiktok and shit um and making it out to be the biggest deal of the world which it obviously isn't let me see if i can find it honestly i feel horrible man i can't wait to go out that's that's the main thing return back to a life of normal just so i can get back to doing get back to being the boring old fuddy dad that i was prior to this that would be much more appreciated than this um you know horrendous um scenario that we're in now at the moment let's see if i can find this post by lukashenko ah how far down is this post that she that this person posted ex-Soviet news I'm on the page now I'm just scanning through scanning through there we go yeah this is the post in it iconic so I, this person's obviously translating what Lukashenko is saying but I'll, I'll I'll just get it up here on the page so then you guys can see so this is the post um it's from uh, the, the Twitter account called ex-Soviet news it says here according to Lukashenko alcoholics are less likely to get coronavirus um, and he quotes uh, but that doesn't mean you should drink half um, a litre a day a shot glass no more I say from Lukashenko that's, that's the advice from to his constituents Ладно, коронавирус тут я так в шутку говорю алкаши меньше болеют но это не значит это не значит что по пол ведра в день выпивать нет Я же говорил, что рюмочку не больше. А некоторые говорят, а президент сказал, будем пить. He's like a stand-up comedian, isn't it? Very Trump-esque, isn't it? All the little laughs in the auditorium. People are not sure whether they should laugh or that they should just, you know, clap. You laugh, you get shot, you clap, you're mocking, right? <laughs> no one's sure exactly what to do there. But um, yeah, man, I kind of wish we had that in the UK. I'm not going to lie. As um as kind of irresponsible as that is to say out loud, I do kind of wish we had the um, possibility where different, I haven't mentioned in a previous podcast, different regions could take it upon themselves to do as they saw fit with their own state and area in terms of how to deal with COVID. It would have been a far more interesting approach. Um, it probably would have been chaos in the streets. People would have been you know, traveling to all parts of England to go and live a quasi normal life. So I'm sure it wouldn't have been a good idea in the long run, but sometimes not doing the best thing and, you know, kind of fucking things that can sometimes be the best thing. You know what I mean? Sometimes doing the wrong thing can be so right. Yeah, it can be so right that it's wrong sometimes. That's what I meant to say. It can be so right, it's wrong. And then I've got a, one more post here before we crack on with all the stuff I need to talk about regarding um, how I'm feeling regarding the approach um, that we're living in at the moment and what we're doing you know as a country and, and my kind of desire as most other as most you know sensible um human beings out there you're probably feeling you know enough's enough and you want to go back and live your normal life i thought this little clip here from bbc news of sir charles walker effectively lamenting the government's response to covid and the lockdown and how we've basically been you know locked in our homes for the best part of what four months um with no real route out until the february 22nd and he's basically had enough you know he's had enough even someone like him who has all the privileges in life that he would need has had enough um, of not being able to do exactly what he needs to do in life and move around as per normal and i think we um as a nation collectively i think myself anyway i echo a lot of his thoughts so let's hear what he has to say we will always argue that it's not the right time just another six months another six months we have the vaccines we have the vaccines. We were told they were the way out of this. So we vaccinate the population, but you're still in lockdown. People are going to start scratching their heads. 
and start wondering what on earth is this, this all about. What the government is doing now is bordering on the very dangerous, to be perfectly honest. It is robbing people of hope. It is robbing people of something to look forward to, and it is very, very stupid and very, very short-sighted. Now, I don't hold the Prime Minister responsible for this, but I do hold his Secretaries of State responsible for this, and he needs to rein them in very, very quickly. Lord Sumption, appearing on Sky News earlier, said Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, had lost his grip on reality, very angry uh, about the travel restrictions that were brought in yesterday, announced yesterday to come into force on Monday, and in particular the potential sentences for those who break the rules and lie about where they've been. What do you make of that? An utterly ridiculous thing for the Secretary of State for Health to say. Are we really going to lock people up for 10 years for being dishonest about the fact that they've been to Portugal? By all means, give them a fine. Give them a hefty fine, a few thousand pounds. Are you really seriously suggesting, Secretary of State, that we've got enough prison capacity to start locking up 19-year-old silly kids for 10 years? What a stupid thing to say. I mean, a really <laughs> stupid thing to say. That demeans, that demeans his office and his position around the cabinet table. I love how he says stupid, stupid. Right? It's a proper uh, posh way. It's quasi-posh and also somewhat Caribbean way of saying stupid. Right? Stupid, stupid. Very stupid. Oh, no. Um, is it an accent? What accent is that from? Is it stupid? Is that Scottish or Irish? They have a way of saying stupid like that, innit? But, yeah, I echo the thoughts of Sir Charles Walker. Um, again, February 22nd could not come sooner. Hopefully, we have some concrete dates. Or I sense there'll be a revolt in the streets, and I'll be leading it. I'll be leading it. Hope you can join me. <laughs> Hope you can join me. I'll end up being the only one getting arrested as well, innit? And being plus all over the metro. But, you know, say la vie. Sacrifice have to be made. Oh, duh, 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 duh. okay, here we go. Nice one. Um, what else we need to go on? Okay, duh, duh, duh. let's continue here. What else we need to talk about? Let me go through the topics quickly. Let me through the topics quickly. Let me go through the topics quickly. Let me go through the topics quickly. Okay, cool. F first things first. We have some good news. As I mentioned previously, don't believe all the scaremongering out there from all the media outlets, right? They have no other reason to exist than to make you scared, make you worried, make you lock up indoors and just, you know, dread the thought of going back outside again. But as this um, year progresses and as we um, develop new uh, protocols and effective medicines in order to combat the virus and, of course, as the vaccine gets rolled out in more and more places, more of the, some of the more, I would say, tolerant tourist um uh rich areas of the world or cities are definitely going to be opening up their doors very very soon because you know as you will know tourism is a big part of their economy and they need to reopen they need to get back and started in order to allow people to kind of you know um have a means to put food on their table plate and also provide money for the city itself so this is courtesy of mixed mag it says new york will allow large venues to safely reopen from february 21st that's a day after they announced it here in the uk um, new york is already going to start introducing the ability for some venues to open with limited capacity now that's no coincidence right the fact that they're doing this already in, in new york considering how tough they've been with lockdown and how kind of you know draconian como has been with some stuff in terms of the outdoor dining all that sort of stuff it is a real good indication of just how soon the world will reopen again so it's a mixed mag it says the following it says new york governor andrew como has announced the state will allow large um venues to reopen from february 23rd at uh, reduced capacity with safety measures in place a testing pilot with the football team buffalo bills last Last month, which allowed six thousand and seven hundred fans into a seventy thousand seater stadium, was decided was declared an unparalleled success by the Cuomo. Attendees were required to produce a negative COVID test seventy two hours before kickoff, and were allowed to sit in a spaced out groups of two or four with contract tracing afterwards. And I think, if I remember correctly, this might have been the same game that I saw all the guys from Griselda, Conway, um, West Side Gun. Uh, Benny the Butcher. I think that was the same time that they went. There were posters, the pictures of them all over the place. So that might have been um, a good, a great actually experiment to do. You know, get some actually. You know, it doubles up as a chance to market the Buffalo Bills, make sure people are aware of the brand, um, get them wearing all the merch. 
influencer stuff on Instagram, social media, blah, 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 blah. And also a great opportunity to test some of the safety protocols they're going to have in place. Um, this is the following. Now, this same testing program is set to be extended to all large stadiums and arenas in under two weeks' time. This accounts for any stadium or arena with a capacity of more than 10,000 people, and they will be allowed to open at 10% capacity to host events such as music shows, performances, and sports. Fans providing a negative PCR test 72 hours in advance is again a requirement and other mitigating measures such as a mask wearing temperature checks and mandatory assigned social distance seating will also be in place venues waiting to reopen under the guidelines must submit plans to the senate department of health to be approved governor Cuomo said the success of this is similar events if in approved venues over the coming weeks will help inform the reopening process for smaller venues in the future he added that testing is the most important cog in the move towards safe reopening of venues he said i can go to see the president of the united states take a test and if i pass the test walk into the office over office why if you're negative your negative testing is key it's funny isn't it the turn he's made the about turn because considering covid he's been very tough and probably unnecessarily so um and to see him do this about turn some people are gonna say it's political because now joe biden's in place suddenly he's being a little bit more um cooperative and opening and open to kind of allow businesses to reopen because there's no point there's no orange man bad to point at the over office or it could just be the fact that you know they've got the numbers down and stuff is reopening yeah, it's natural natural course who knows who knows he continues However, Scott Weinsberg, an infectious disease specialist and director of the medical, uh, the travel medicine program at NYU Longgate Heath, warned that people tested negative COVID-19 one day uh, about being infected, um, uh, but being infected and able to transmit the virus uh, the, on the day of the event remains possible. It's interesting that every health expert in the world, even in the UK, we have them. They're always saying this, isn't it? Whenever somebody comes out in 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 government and says, hey, we're planning to reopen, maybe ahead of schedule, uh, reduce capacity to allow people to kind of get back to their normal lives, um, you know, improve mental health, allow for people to have the possibility to put food on their table, keep a roof over their head. There's always a health expert in the background saying, hey, guys, that's too soon that's too soon we should stay you indoors stay inside it's like you really can't listen to these guys at all can you you have to maybe take what they say obviously into consideration but you can't base your entire decision making process on your health advisors because if if you do you're going to be end up staying indoors the entire time the entire year to maybe for another five maybe another decade you know what i mean it's absolutely insane um it continues last month in his state of the state address cuomo said that reopening cannot wait until everyone is vaccinated because the economy the psychology and the emotional cost the psychological and economic cost would be incredible so emotional cost so i'll read that again the economic the psychological and the emotional cost would be incredible and i agree that should be the main thing that should be driving the decision making process especially this far down i think if if you're this far along the virus journey and you still haven't got a handle on the numbers or you're having to put in place some very draconian aggressive measures in order to keep, keep people from not moving around freely then that is probably an indication of your failure to address the issue beforehand so if you failed in the beginning and now you're kind of punishing us for your own failures you have to just let the let, let the horses run free it is what it is you're already effed up already in it like those deaths are unavoidable Un they're unavoidable right they're, they're regrettable but they're unavoidable because you already made that mistake right it's like it's like you're trying to it's like um it's like trying to outwork a bad diet it's you can't do it we're already here where we are let's deal with what we have to deal with and go from there especially with the vaccine in the background it continues we must begin increasing economic activity and using science to do so making covid testing and vaccinations available so that we can reopen restaurants and and art spaces and theaters and commercial businesses while coronavirus infection rates are declining in new york they're still relatively high with an average of 8,588 recorded cases in the past seven days last month the highest peak in cases recorded throughout the breadth of the pandemic with 14,719 cases recorded in one day cuny public of health um, ep epidemiology professor dennis nash warned the new york approach take lacks a scientific basis when community prevalence is very high to think about bringing people into large groups and mass gatherings including in the arenas right now seems cross purposes um with our efforts to really maximize the impact of the vaccine rollout we will have in control in the pandemic like i said i just think it's too late now man um you know uh, people's lives have been completely wrecked by this already obviously due to the virus itself but especially due to the um 
the approach that some governments and some states have taken towards it. Now we're in a situation we have to make the best of what we can. We have the vaccine in the background. We've already ellipsed a lot of time. Lots of people have basically caught the virus, got and developed antibodies. There's obviously still that misnomer of just because you have a high number of cases doesn't mean you're going to have a high number of deaths. Um, there's loads of things to kind of um, account for it. But in general, we're in we're, we're fast approaching what the, the beginning of summer um, in 2021. The last thing we need is an entire year of living under lockdown. People should be allowed some um, ability to go back to their normal lives if, if they can in a safe and proper way. But the last thing we need is to abide by the exact measurements set out by health professionals, because if it's up to them, they would have us locked in place until the rest of time. Okay, what else we have here? I want to talk about quickly before we move on. Du, 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 du. Let's talk over here. Let's move there. Let's move here. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Let's go on this one. So, um... It appears like Gorilla Glue Girl has had her hair unstuck and she saved her hair. The surgeon um, ended up saving her hair. I'm absolutely flabbergasted by it. I think I mentioned in a previous podcast that I was fairly sure that her hair would have to get shaved. I don't know. I just assumed if it was glue and it was, you know, um, known to be a very strong um, adhesive that didn't come out too easily. And considering how long it's been in her hair and how, you know, complex and, you know, um, annoying and messy hair is to sort out in that way. I just imagined the only way to do this would be to, for her to be shaved off, especially when they started mentioning talk of a plastic surgeon. I just assumed this was kind of the obvious route for her to go. But somehow... A surgeon in LA managed to develop some sort of um, uh, liquid that was able to dissolve the glue in her hair. So now she's able to actually run her fingers through her hair. I think it's the first time in a month or something. Absolutely insane. Um, so this is a headline from TMZ. It says, Gorilla Glue Head, Gorilla Glue Hairdo. She's finally unstuck. See the video of the miracle itself, right? Medical surgery. Number one. She's got TMZ in the surgery room with her, right? So this Gorilla Glue girl, who's not a girl, she's a 40-year-old woman who should have known better, got herself in a kerfuffle of her own accord, um, received an outpouring of support on social media because we're living in COVID times. People feel feeling a little bit kinder than they would be if they were living their everyday life. Raised, what, close to 10 grand on GoFundMe. Got offered a free concert, well, a free surgery in order to kind of sort this out and flew, flew, flew out to LA to go do so. Um, it's absolutely insane. Uh, a very verified badge on Instagram and now she's basically had the ability to go back to square one and normal and now I'm sure she'll have a company reach out to her that offers you know a wig um a wig service hair treatment salon whatever it may be called she's gonna have a whole bevy full of treats lined up for her along her journey of um stardom which is really really nuts considering it um all things going forward it continues here it says, um, Tissia Brown, the woman whose hair has been gorilla glued for more than a month, finally has sweet relief. And we have a video of the surgery that saved the day. As we first reported, Tissia took up to Beverly Hills plastic surgeon Michael Obeng on his offer to perform the 12,500 procedure for free. And it was a pretty grueling process, about four hours long. Jesus Christ, amazing. Um, and obviously, the doctor's a black dude as well. Um, so, um, congrats to him for doing the deed. Um, it probably was quite important that it was a black guy. I think the fact that he was kind of familiar with black hair and had some experience behind it probably helped, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, what, what an absolute crazy experience to be involved in. Let's just quickly play the video. The relief, she's actually keeps, she keeps touching her hair, running her fingers there through it. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> How's it feel to feel your hair like Jesus that again? The TMZ reporters interviewing her while she's lying on the operation table, still probably higher for, um, you know, <laughs> higher for a couple of drugs to sedate her. I could. It looks great. No, yeah, I really didn't think it was going to end up here like that. Incredible. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know how she even put that thing in her hair by mistake. Like, what, what is going to... I don't know. Maybe it's just me. What would what would super glue be doing in your bathroom? Like, especially setting spray or that sort of... It's an adhesive that, that can be used 
it said he's living in a, in a spray sort of um, form, right? If I'm not mistaken. Or whatever. Even if it's a liquid form. What's super good doing in people's bathrooms? I know people have weird places to put stuff. Like, I know, you know, some people might have some saucepans underneath the bathroom because it's the only place um, that they have for storage or in a cupboard somewhere. But usually, you put stuff in places that you basically need. I don't know. You'd assume a, a, a tub of super glue would be maybe in your living room or somewhere on your desk, in your bedroom, but it wouldn't be in your bathroom, would it? So it's such an odd thing in general. I wish I'd have waited for shit for my little sister to cut my ponytail off. Right. You were in pain though, you had to. But I mean... Extensions are easy. Yeah, but not for six weeks. You didn't have to start from zero at least. <laughs> Is she complaining? Don't get me wrong. Is she complaining that her ponytail had to get cut off? She's complaining that she should have been, she should have gone to his doctor earlier in order to kind of ensure that she kept her ponytail. Is she legitimately complaining? After everything that's gone on, after raising close to what, $10,000 on GoFundMe for a mistake that she made herself, right? A big grown woman putting setting spray or super glue in your hair because you thought it was setting spray. It was absolutely insane. You get given the benefit of doubt on social media because we're all suffering from COVID and we all kind of have an empathetic side of our heart has opened up during this time. And then you're up, you're unhappy that you didn't get to keep your ponytail. <laughs> How do you feel now that this whole ordeal is basically over? The over, over, over. Just crying. Mm. Just fast forward a bit more. I have a ponytail. You'll have a ponytail in six weeks. That's, <laughs> That's right. She's legit crying, complaining about her ponytail. This is typical. Women are fucking insane, isn't it? Women are nuts. Women are absolutely crazy, right? You get put in this. You put yourself in this situation. Society fixes it for you, and you're still complaining. And it's for free. For free too. I'm sure she didn't give the guy a tip. I'm sure she probably didn't. She probably w walked out there and gave the guy a hug and thanked her and cried on his shoulder, gave her a kiss on the cheek, maybe not because of COVID times, and went about a business. He didn't get, he obviously he got loads of free promo for this. This was probably um, excellent for his um, surgery in general going forward. You know, whether or not it is that excellent if you think about it, because who else is going to purposely or mistakenly put, you know, flipping Gorilla Glue in their hair anyway going forward? Probably not. She's probably the only person in history who's probably done it. But still, you're complaining about your ponytail. The entitlement is insane. Now, or you're done with hair products for a while. You need your hair done. <laughs> and and now she feels kind of embarrassed, like sitting there on the operation table with her hair all fucked up. She kind of doesn't want the cameras to be there. But obviously, you kind of took them along with a little. I'm sure they kind of lined their pockets and maybe provided her with you know transport or whatever it may be. Like, oh yeah, yeah, this is this woman is just uh, an absolute peach, isn't it? Um, Tissue was under light anesthesia, so a light um, under a light anesthesia during the procedure. Um, you've got to see her reaction as she came out of it and immediately reached for her hair. She got pretty choked up once she realized um, she could once again run her fingers through it. We asked if she'd done with hair styling glue, a nightmare, and let's just say that she has big plans for this weekend. As we reported, Tisha had flown to LA from Louisiana Wednesday morning, hoping. Dr. Obeng could do what he tried, um, what she tried unsuccessfully to do more than months ago. Remember in the pitch, uh, in a pinch, she had swapped out her normal spray for Gorilla Glue adhesive, thinking that she'd be able to wash it out in a few hours later. Since then, she'd been through the ringer, suffering severe headaches, trying at home remedies, and even went to the ER, but everything made up her scalp burn intensely. So let's see what the guy had to say. The perfect solution. When I first heard of it, initially I thought it was a joke. But my office said, hey, can you, can you remove the oh, glue, glue from somebody's cap? I she's got the best accent, isn't it? I love the mixture of the African and American accent. That's super sick. When I heard what she said, I was like, oh, that's super cool. He sounds amazing. Of course. And I walked home. I thought it, I brushed it off. And the next thing you know, ha, brushed it I off. Ask I looked up the compound. Okay, the main active ingredient Gorilla Glue, you know, polyurethane and we figure out the science how to break it down so i then decided you know i now we're going to reinvent the here the, the wheel so we has we bought chemicals that has components to dissolve or a good mm. solvent it's medical grade adhesive remover wow we use in the operating room uh, the company was very generous to us they brought me some they even saw me mix it up today uh, when they were here um, and then the active ingredient, I have another ingredient called MGD. 
add an MGD to it, okay, which is uh, aloe vera and olive oil mixture, okay, and then we add a little, a little um, acetone, a little acetone. Unfortunately, I don't know why Gorilla Glue doesn't have a solution to it, and actually, I did make a phone call to Gorilla Glue. Uh -huh. They were nice enough to return my call, but I never talked to them. You know, uh, like I said, I have a chemistry background, so I knew that any compound, any compound can be broken down. And we went and got hair. So this is all hair, okay? Very typical black hair, okay? Real hair. Real hair. This is real human hair. Okay. You know, like everything we do, real human hair, we got it. We stuck it here, okay? And then we use hair extension. So this is hair extension, okay, with Gorilla Glue, okay? I can spin this all day. My kids were playing with last night. <laughs> and we went ahead with the chemicals that we made. We started using it. All this was matted down. All this was matted down, okay? We sprayed the first, so it started untangling. And I knew we had a product that would work. Surgery went well. Amazing, uh, isn't it? He's the real MVP out of this, to be honest. Again, um, I'm not sure why people are making this a responsibility of Gorilla Glue. Um, they probably never had something like this happen in the whole history of the company being around. Um, one person made a catastrophic mistake, which many people wouldn't have ever made in their entire lives. They got given free treatment, got you know an amazing fundraising support, sympathy from social media, which is generally quite cruel, and they're still unhappy that they had to cut off their ponytail. Typical entitled behavior. Again, hopefully this is over as an ordeal for us, the viewing public. Um, the last thing we need to be doing is paying attention to such nonsense and we could all move on with our day. But the doctor, Dr. Obeng, is the MVP. He deserves all the props and all the attention and adulation. He ended up saving this woman's hair because I was more than sure that she'd have to shave it go bored and start again from scratch which again wouldn't have been a bad thing because we're living in probably one of the best eras for wigs ever in the history of time okay moving on oh this woman man so annoying isn't it so ungrateful um what else we got here oh yes I think I've mentioned it prior in a few times already. Like I'm already, you know, super fed up and over the whole sneaker culture game, sneaker buying thing. I'm fed up of it. It's annoying. It's bullshit. It's a fixed game. It's rigged. It's absolutely annoying. And why do I say that? I say that from a point of reference and a point of experience. I used to work in a very popular sneaker store here in the UK, specifically in London. And I knew the kind of fugazi, no, kind of, I, I knew the, 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 the unscrupulous behaviors that went on behind the scenes in order to get the shoes from the factory to the shop floor and into your hands. They go through a lot of hoops. They go through a lot of people. Uh, people get, you know, pairs before they've even left the um, delivery trucks. It's a very dirty and hypocritical game. So the fact that people set up, you know, the ability for you to win raffles in order to have the chance to buy something with your hard-earned money is a real kick in the teeth, especially when you consider the sneaker industry is a $1 billion industry, maybe more than a billion dollar industry last time I checked, right? Most uh, brands outside the top three are still selling like hotcakes, red Retros all over the places. It's a big business. It's not the niche industry that it was prior. So the excuse that these companies had before that they wouldn't want to produce anything to not dilute the market and to make things more covetable is absolute pony bullshit they should just make more shoes have the ability for people to actually purchase them and walk in to get them instead of this nonsense we have at the moment why is it that I can go into a shop and buy the new iphone buy a new imac and buy a new pair of headphones but i can't buy a, a, my favorite pair of shoes because they've decided to only release them in limited quantities to a select brand of stores who put them up for raffling and then they end up getting backdoored and if you're wondering what backdoored mean backdoor effectively means before they even hit the shop floor before they're out of their boxes and on Onto the, onto the stockroom shelves they've already been allocated to other people in order to get them out of the back and why do I know that because I've done it myself I've been able to take shoes out of rotation before they've come out of delivery and put them underneath the till and sometimes not even purchase them so imagine what's happening nowadays with the um, excess amount of shoes that are being produced year in, year out. It's absolutely insane. So over the weekend, um, you know, Nike continued doing their bullshit moves and they put out this shoe, the Nike um, Air Jordan Trophy Room, which was specifically released in the Trophy Room store, which is a store owned by Marcus Jordan, if I'm not mistaken. He's the son of Michael Jordan. That's exactly his only claim to fame. He rides that fame, um, you know, until the wheels come home. And anybody on the Nike Talk forum will know um, how much of a despicable human being being that Marcus Jordan is but we get it you're the son of Jordan you're going to use that clout and use that notoriety you know to kind of get yourself where you need to get yourself it is what it is so this is an article here from Twitter 
It says the following, while some of the weeks most anticipated sneak releases are typically fall on Saturday, two coveted Air Jordan 1s were up for grabs this morning, including the OG style neutral grey Air Jordan 185, which I caught a massive L on. Congrats to me. As well as the freeze out Jordan 1 high in collaboration with Trophy Room, the store owner operated by Michael Jordan's son, Marcus. I tried to sign up and guess what? Error, error, error. It continues. Both releases went down at 10 a.m. ET. Neutral Grey saw typical launch in a sneakers app, quickly notifying shoppers that their pair were purchased or not, which again, I absolutely hate. I've only... The, the sneakers app is weird. I've won four pairs of shoes from the Nike 10 Virgil Abloh collaboration, and that's it. I've not won anything else from the sneakers app. That's it. Four pairs in a row, but not one ever since. I'm not sure if I've been, if my account's been flagged or whatever, but somehow, somehow that happened. It continues. Um, the latter style was made available via Raffle on the Trophy Room website, which resulted in numerous crashes that left many people unsuccessful in submitting an entry. The website issues had led to a store to switch to email entries, which also experienced hiccups after the inbox was overloaded. A second opening um, for Trophy Room email began at 12.45, but now has ended. So they tried to release it three times, and still, they weren't able to put them out for sale for most people to kind of put their entries in. And guess what? That gave ample time for the resellers and all these other dorky kids online to decide to grab a few pairs and pose with a million boxes on their floor and basically piss everybody off. It continued. Later to 12,000 pairs of trophy made Jordan 1 freeze up. Pay summary to the rumoured freezing out of May MJ by his teammates during the first ever NBA All-Star Game section of 1985. It sports an iconic Chicago colour scheme but features a frozen look throughout the red overlay and the upper which sits atop the sail midsole and a translucent sole as a shoe um objectively as a jordan one because they're a bit they're a bit of a um you know overused model and they're a bit tired i'm a bit bored of seeing the shape everywhere it's a pretty cool colorway and a pretty cool reinterpretation of a classic to be honest right no, you know, we, we don't have to hit on that. Given how limited the demand was for the collab, it's suspected the most sneakerheads uh, will come away empty-handed, so we round up some of the best reactions from today's drop to help everyone uh, smile throughout the pain. Uh, Trev Room trying to figure out the increase of the email limit. Of course, the weekend um, image there, a screenshot here from the delivery status notification or from the out, from the Outlook, I think, email, email box as well, which is um, incredible to imagine that a, trof a, sto a, sto a store such as Trophy Room with the amount of revenue that they do, that they have an Outlook email box or whatever it may be um loads of funny sketches but the most infuriating thing out of this whole uh, you know crazy drama is pictures like this and if you're listening via you know if you're listening only then essentially it's a picture of these kids who are just surrounded by pairs and pairs of trophy room air jordan ones all legit with the stub um next to them you know and just kind of gloating in the face of everybody like thinking hey these guys are killing it these guys are ruining it for everybody and i think this is effectively in my opinion why i've decided to kind of just start buying fakes now like i've d devoted what the best part of 20 plus years of my life to sneakers and streetwear specifically streetwear actually sneakers probably second i kind of got into it specifically to be the next james jebia hiroshi fujiwara aaron bondaroff nigo and all those kind of guys right those guys i looked up to and of course the sneakers came second but this game is rigged. This game is an absolute rigged game. It's pointless to even get involved in. Every shoe that you want, every shoe that you would like is limited. Um, they release them in limited quality tees, which then means that they um, have some sort of value on a resale market, which then means it attracts these spotty little kids who seem to regen. Every single decade, there seems to be a new batch of these little scrawny, um, you know, reselling kids who pump up the prices of particular shoes and basically make them unattainable for the average guy like me and you who just wants to wear their trainers. That's the thing if i wanted to resell as much as these guys and i was involved in the game fair enough the game is the game you win some you lose some but you when you actually want to wear your shoes and you can't even buy them that's when it really starts to hurt and that's when it really starts to get annoying um so this is again this image is a perfect representation as to why someone like myself who spent 20 plus years buying sneakers the legit way going through it the normal way reaching out um to stores emailing my entries in submitting fucking annoying posts on instagram and i've done it once that instagram stuff right click um, click on our profile like the page post a comment tag a friend follow us on the thing never again am i doing that stuff again i'm not going to bend over backwards to try and pair a pair of shoes to try and try and buy a pair of shoes i'm sorry i'm flipping muffling my words i'm not going to do that anymore it's not that serious move on go somewhere else there are plenty of factories in china that will be willing to make reps of these and they'll look close enough to next to what they need to wear i'm not going to try and resell them anyway so it doesn't really matter that's why the fakes are booming and then we have here another image of the shoe itself. 
you know, a pretty standard um, Chicago colorway, Air Jordan High, Air Jordan 1 High. Again, why do people make mids? Do you wonder why, why do mids exist of Air Jordan 1? It makes absolutely no sense. Lows, maybe. Again, they look flipping horrendous. They look like they've, they look like, um, they've run out of material. But the mids are such an irrelevant um, design to even make in the first place, aren't they? But objectively, again, the lacing. Oh, the lacing is so bad. Why do Nike do this with their, with their product shots? They don't relace the shoes. It's something I never really understood. But objectively, the shoes. Gonna continue up. So is it crashed? I don't know what's happening here. Maybe it's crashed a little bit. The screen needs to reload because I think it's um it's recognize how angry I am. Um, let's go here, and then yeah, more images again of people trying to enter to purchase the shoes and getting an error message. So like I said, man, I'm over this, man. I really am. I'm not sure about you guys. I'm over entering these sneaker competitions. Um, in order to kind of win the chance to purchase a shoe, I'm just gonna start buying my shoes from China. Um, I don't give a crap. I don't care. I've committed. 20 plus years to buy these shoes a legit way i know what goes on behind the scenes i'm not willing to you know get on my knees and slob on a knob in order to buy a pair and email people and ask for favors agostino doesn't ask for favors Agostino doesn't ask for anything i've got my own money i want to purchase stuff i want to wear it if i can't do it the legit way i'm gonna have to begrudgingly go the unlegit way join me in our rep fight my friends join me in our rep fight in our resistance against the tyrannical machine that is nike that's oppressing us and not allowing us to ability to purchase shoes with our hard-earned money how nuts is that huh how nuts is that oh these people man these bloody people anyways let's move on how many we used on there let's see this okay What else we got here? Mm -mm -mm. Da, da, da. Yeah, let's go here. Let's do this. Okay, so <clears throat> let's do this. Let's end it on here. I think it might be a good way to end it. So let's do this. Let's go here. So um, what do you guys think about the idea of Sambas? They've obviously made a bit of a um, re. They've obviously had a bit of a resurgence over the last year or so. It feels like, uh, maybe the last couple of years. I'm gonna say specifically, maybe due to ASAP Rocky wearing them a few times. I think from some of the style pages I follow, especially places like um, Who Is Celebrity Vice, he's been posting a few images of ASAP Rocky wearing them. Maybe I think a year or two years ago, and there was a lot of comments on the in uh, on the pictures saying, "Oh, what are those shoes?" and people tagging them because I think he just swapped out the white laces for a pair of neon laces, kind of bringing that look back and um there seemed to be a lot of hype around it right i'm assuming because it's just a, an og that you can buy in line adidas it makes more sense and plus the samba is actually a legitimately interesting shoe to wear i'm a big fan of it myself obviously coming from the uk because of its links to um terrace culture um in football and soccer maybe as you call it in america and um but generally i've always been a fan of the kind of um astro turfy um soccer football trainer in general i remember the times when people used to wear the nike fcs is it fcs you remember those from back in the day they were kind of um an interpretation of an indoor um soccer shoe um that you'd wear maybe for five a side that was maybe re that was reappropriate for skateboarding which made sense considering the fact that those shoes would need a lot of grip, um, you know, um, when you're kind of playing soccer indoors, so they kind of reappropriated those and made them, um, you know, um, the perfect companion for grip tape and shit. I think I remember a time when Alex Olsen was wearing a lot of those kind of Astro Turfy type shoes. So the Samba kind of sits in that same sort of category, very thin model, and um, probably one of the only models I think of that sort of silhouette that I can actually wear with my Giganto feet. Um, even though it's quite narrow at the front, it's still quite square. It's got kind of a rectangularish sort of um the toe box at the front where it kind of tapers in it's not as pointy as maybe an agdas gazelle which kind of allows for the much movement but ever since i've seen kind of is that rookie wear them begrudgingly i've decided not to buy a pair because i just found whenever those guys wear those type of things it just kind of you know increases the value exponentially and obviously you then get the annoying um 
um, instances or encounters that usually occur when you wear those kind of things and people automatically say, oh, you're wearing the ASAP Rocky shoes, isn't it? Or you're wearing the ASAP Nas shoes. And as soon as I saw actually ASAP Nas wearing a pair of shoes, who tends to be the kind of the second early adopter of those sort of things, if, if Rocky starts wearing kilts, Nas will start wearing them second, which then starts to permeate the general population because I think a lot of people for some reason follow him and really have kind of resonated with his style, even though I kind of think it's a little bit haphazard. But here you go, what can I say? Here am I, here I am sitting with a what five dollar Pink Floyd t shirt and um, criticizing some someone like Ace of Nest style, but al alas, we are on the internet. I'm allowed to say what I want and what I please. Um, and yeah, so I guess um, this um, Twitter profile that I follow, which is pretty good, it's called Streetwear Nightlife, and this is the following post here it says, Hey, that Samba hype is real. Um, Nas really is the source of this one. What's funny is Jerry Lorenzo, who commented on Nas's first pick and then went out and got his own pair, of course, naturally. Don't you can't really blame Jerry Lorenzo, he is now you know essentially part of the ADAS team. He's got a very senior role there, a part of the ADAS basketball division, which I covered before on the podcast. So that makes complete sense. And as well, considering the kind of shoes that he likes, the ADAS Samba will kind of fit into the kind of Jerry Lorenzo style of things, right? It's quite thin profile, it allows that kind of loose lacing thing that he does with his shoes. I can Im imagine him kind of maybe using a Samba as an inspiration for the other models that he's done for his own brand, Fear of God. So that's a bit of a side to kind of put, a bit of out of words to put in that respect. And as well, they haven't included Asa Rocky, who I think was the first person I saw from this whole contingent of people who actually wore the Samba. And it says here, and Sean are jumping on the hype. I guess Sean is the guy from what? Sean Wolverspoon, I guess, Wolverspoon, how you pronounce the name, are jumping on a hype to try and stay ahead of the game, but it's a bit too obvious. Staying ahead of the game. Now, staying ahead of the game is a really interesting phrase to use in sneaker culture because I think, in my opinion, it's really easy. I think for the most part, people that buy sneakers or are into fashion, into streetwear, are quite lazy with their options of, of shoes that they wear. There's so many amazing shoes, especially from the big three brands that exist, that aren't the most popular ones that could easily be incorporated into most people's style that would obviously fit what they wear a lot more than Air Jordans and Air Force Ones and Yeezys and whatever every typical thing everyone else wears. Just kind of deviate. Even, um, even um, in the Air Max range alone, there's so many other shoes outside of the Air Max 90, Air Max 1, Air Max 97 that could be worn that are very overlooked. So I think a lot of these guys, even though they try to stay ahead, are really behind the curve in general because I remember when I was growing up, the whole idea behind being a sneakerhead was kind of uh, the ability to kind of source out and pick out the... Uh, hidden gems in terms of what is available in terms of sneakers, right? Going out there and finding the stuff that people don't necessarily wear, but they're making it hot. Yep, that's what I remember. Um, so the people, things that people are doing at the moment, I think are a little bit irrelevant. Let's see the pictures of Asap Nasweno himself. That's the first picture of him, forehead to toe with them. Looks pretty cool in the outfit. Joe Lorenzo wearing them, of course, in his signature loose lace fit style, which makes sense and really works with the stuff that he wears. And another picture here of Sean Weatherspoon putting a, an image of him kind of with a box on there. So I think in general, it makes sense that they do this. For ADAS, it's a pretty cool tactic. Um, they've probably reached out to these influencers and sent them free pairs and just told them, hey, don't mention that you got this from your plug emoji insert there and just kind of post them and just kind of do an organic kind of reach that way. It kind of reminds me a little bit of what they did with the Adidas um stan smith uh, original right i remember somebody i was involved in it once told me about the whole idea that came around them and why they, how they basically were able to kind of reintroduce them to the market and kind of i did i think they did them in like three grades or two grades i think there was a gr model and an og model that was basically rolled out and it was basically done in a very organic way reach out to people who would kind of resonate with a shoe which is a far better way to do the whole influencer activation thing don't just send them out to everybody that's got a million followers but actually send them out to people specifically who would wear that kind of shoe um and that obviously was allowed allowed it to kind of grow organically and actually influence culture in the right way and get people to actually purchase them when they are available for sale because sometimes you see a lot of people get stuff seeded to them it then goes on sale and it doesn't really sell that well because people don't care about the model but actual influence is the ability to go out and seed it to particular influencers who resonate with a brand who have some affinity with the shoe itself or sneaker culture in general who then can able to showcase it to their fan base so that when the shoe is available and made for purchase they can go out and purchase them in droves and then we have a second uh quote here 
no, we have another image here actually. Um, or oh, let's read the quote actually from Streetwear Night Live. He says the following: Let's not forget that these little hype bursts will always come and go, and that doesn't really define an item in, in that very moment. I just report what I notice and see and how it affects people's purchasing habits. He says here continues. If I'm being honest, I'm down for the standby hype, and I hope that Adidas is doing this internally by sending free pairs to influencers. It's time for Adidas to stop pumping superstar collabs and work with different silhouettes because they have the potential, they lack the execution. Of course, I think Adidas probably has one of the most overlooked archives in the history or in, in the entire sneaker industry to be honest right I think even stuff like brands like Puma have really amazing things in their archive that they aren't they're probably unwilling to reintroduce to the market because for the most part people only know them for one model maybe the Puma Clyde or whatever it may be um, they're kind of branching out a little bit now you feel like with the J. Cole stuff and some of the other basketball shoes but loads of these brands kind of rely too heavily on their retros and their stuff that they, they're kind of legacy items and don't maybe go or, well, well they're iconic legacy items they don't go for stuff that maybe is overlooked but needs to basically be reintroduced slowly I think New Balance to do that really well they have a very clever way of reintroducing models that aren't necessarily that well known um into the in, you know into the current consciousness by lining up with different you know brands you look at the amelie leon door um and new balance five five fifties i think they were five five zeros um they were kind of an overlooked model that kind of got reintroduced and now you're seeing gr models slowly but surely kind of come out into the market collaboration with size with that kind of malarkey and i think adas needs to do this more often uh but again i think maybe in a race to compete with nike they kind of rely too heavily on the iconic um G and the iconic original silhouettes and they don't maybe embrace more of these models that could be uh spread out to a lot more people because i think in, even in the uk samba sell really well because they'll sell really well week in week out i'm sure if you went to a place like jd sports or foot they'll tell you they probably get through a ton of those shoes on a weekly basis so if they were able to kind of line up with the right places they'll be able to do that properly uh, it's another post here says pharmatics co-owner of De uh, brain dead uh, big up Carl Eng. It says he had posted a pair of Sambas. This is confirmation that Adidas is trying to bring the hype back by sending free pairs around. I wonder if they have a collab on the way to kickstart the hype. Of course they will. They, that's what they always do. Um, uh, Nike kind of have a, a similar approach at the moment where, not similar they're actually, they sometimes do the whole like high fashion collaboration. They'll kind of reach out to Undercover, Comme des Garçons, um, Sakai, a few other people, uh, Junai Watanabe uh, to reintroduce a model. And then as that gets reintroduced on the runway, that gets put out to the tier zero stores and then from then on that model then goes out into gr and then or not gr you know whatever that other lane is underneath tier zero and then from there it goes in gr and goes into the current rotation but yeah i'm down with the samba hype i like it personally for me now that i've seen these guys wearing them i'm definitely not going to wear them myself because i just like to kind of deviate from the um you know the, com the the kind of popular convention that exists out there but i'm excited or interested to know what you guys think are you are you super involved in the samba hype are you getting involved as well or do you think like myself that it's maybe a little bit overcooked now and it's a kind of you know beating a dead horse already even though it's only been what best part of a year or so maybe just underneath it let me know in the comments down below anyway that's the excellent show episode number four three three thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company i'll see you again another time take care be safe peace